Well, look, we can't stop, Lisa. We've talked about uh, nuclear wep- uh, talk, talk about nuclear submarines, not weapons. Well, I mean, submarines are weapons. But nuclear power is on the agenda today, and rightly so, after the announcement about the purchase of these subs over the next 20 years. Water can't be forgotten. I've talked about the Bradfield scheme. We've talked about iron boomerang, the idea of a rail line across the north. Nation-building stuff improves our sovereignty, our ability to make stuff. Scott Morrison, don't stop with this. There's much more to be done, Lisa. Well, I think what this does is, and we discussed it earlier tonight, it it opens the conversation yet again and puts it front and centre. So COVID has dominated, as we know, the headlines for 18, 20 months now. So that was the big change with with what we've seen in the the past few days. We're talking about uh, nuclear submarines. The, The big change was there was a change in technology. So no longer do they have to have... Uh, the nuclear capabilities on land to be able to have these nuclear Mm. subs in Australia. So that was one of of the changing uh, moments. That was one of the big ticks. But we now have to look at how do we go from accepting nuclear on the water to nuclear on land? And it's a conversation that we can't just put... To use a COVID term, we can't just keep hiding under the doona away from it. We have to have an open debate about it. And if you talk to people across business sectors or, or just people in the street in general... Most people don't live terrified of the idea of of nuclear power, certainly not the people I'm talking to. They're open to it. And as we're having this pressure put on on us from the international community to to go green and cut emissions, it makes sense. I I don't understand why the conversation isn't being had. So hopefully this can be a catalyst towards that. And, and Stephen, to your point, I mean, the French have capacity. I mean, you flick a light switch on in Paris Mm -hmm. and you don't go, tisk, tisk, that's come from a nuclear power station. The fact that it has. Same in Germany, the biggest economy of Europe. Uh, It's reasonable. I've watched little mushroom clouds above the heads of lefties from Adam Bant to Anthony Albo. Uh, they've, they've, they've just... They've all just... They've just been this implosion that something different has been done by the government here. Let's keep different going. We need more of this. Absolutely. And, look, I've, I've been an advocate for nuclear energy for a long, long time because, well, firstly, it's clean, but secondly, we've got the, the uranium deposits. And it's not only the French technology. Of course, you've got those small modular reactors that are available out of the United States now. And and a lot of the rhetoric around there against nuclear energy has always been based on... Well, Adam Bant continued it this week, um, you know, talking about the disaster in Chernobyl and, and uh, Fukushima. And the reality is that oh. if you don't build nuclear plants on a fault line in a tsunami-prone zone and you don't use dodgy 1950s Russian technology, you're probably going to be OK. Um, but this has been one of the... And this is my criticism of the Prime Minister on this, is that there's an opportunity for the government to take leadership and actually overturn the ban on domestic nuclear power uh, or at least start the debate. But they seem to be hiding behind this um, wish for bipartisanship before they'll do it, which, well, as long as the member for Graindler is the leader of the opposition, they're never going to get bipartisanship on it. And that's why the government needs to take the lead on this. Yeah, and Bronwyn, I'd bring one of my favourite lefties, that's the great Martin Ferguson AM, I'd bring him to the table. He understands this Mm. stuff. And, look, let's face it, the the Prime Minister's going to be put under all this pressure. And Lisa said to me uh, during the break, you know, the whole not much happened in G7 kind of rhetoric has now been pierced completely. So Scott Morrison, I think, is the leader of this AUKUS thing. This is his idea. He and Peter Dutton have put this thing together with Maurice Payne. He's got to show some leadership again in Glasgow. And as you said earlier, it's great. This is terrific. Don't burn coal. But by the way, we're going to because we can and we need it. It's the only way we can keep the lights on in Australia at a reasonable cost. Exactly. Exactly. And and as I've said before, this climate change policy uh, that is being pushed by the United Nations and the elites, the elites that go to Davos who think they're Mm -hmm. superior to everybody else and that uh, they really want to rule the world, their statement, you know, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, that's the definition of a slave. And and many slaves were happy. Um, They didn't know what freedom tasted like. But... If, if we are, if we don't stick by our guns, um, we sign the death knell for, for our manufacturing sector, and that includes in the defence industry sector too, because yep. unless we are able to assure a cheap supply of energy, which used to be our only competitive advantage, 
because of the way our industrial relations system developed, our wages are higher, um, we pay people better, we look after people better. Uh, but if we don't give ourselves that competitive edge of cheap electricity, um, then we push ourselves out of the ball game. And that's how we got into this mess of buying so much from China and accepting their slave labour for the products we buy. Yeah. Uh, and that includes those damn windmills and solar panels that come from China to here as well. So aside from that side of the debate, we have to be realistic that having a solid, deliverable system of electricity, uh, which uh, can be utilised to protect our nation, it's part of our defence effort. So it's part and parcel. Yeah. So if you want no emissions, then you have to have nuclear.